uh, good morning, everybody, and a warm welcome to this session covering peatland conservation goals and monitoring in the UK. I'm uh, Pete Jones. I work for Natural Resources Wales as their lead advisor on peatland ecosystems, and I'm chairing this morning's um, session. So to cover this subject, we've a diverse and exciting platform of six speakers covering biodiversity evaluation and monitoring across a range of spatial scales and for a variety of purposes, ranging from ecosystem scale down to our much neglected microbial biodiversity. Um, to start this session, it's a pleasure to hand over to Stephen Grady of the Joint Nature Conservation Committee. And just a reminder, if you wish to post a question, please use the Q&A tab. And also remember that you can vote for the questions you really think need asking. OK, thank you, Stephen. Over to you, please. Thank you very much, Pete. And uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Stephen Grady. I work at the uh, Joint Nature Conservation Committee um, uh, in Peterborough. Um, I'm in the international advice team. I'm really pleased to be opening up this session um, uh, this morning. Um, JNCC is responsible for coordinating UK-wide conservation status assessments of species and habitats listed on the uh, EU Habitats Directive. The last report was in 2019 and also the status and trend assessments for birds um, under the EU uh, Birds Directive, also the last report was in 2019. Um, obviously, we're, we're now leaving the EU, so I will come to that at the end of my talk, the implications of that in terms of our future reporting at UK level on conservation status. But my talk uh, will cover concepts of conservation status, what they are, how we measure conservation status at the UK level, um, what are the outcomes of the 2019 UK reporting with a particular focus on peatlands, um, the presentation is focused particularly on peatland habitats rather than peatland species, using active raised bog habitat to demonstrate the approach and results. Um, and we're also, as I said, looking to the future around the implications of leaving the EU and what the future drivers will be um, to assessing uh, conservation status. So, um, before I delve into the first slide, I just thought it was important to think about what is conservation status or what are the different ways that we actually assess that. So for species, you could consider, for example, the red listing process as a way of assessing conservation status, although it's, it's related to threat. Um, there's also a, um, a, what we call a quin quinquennial review that JNCC coordinates across the UK, which reviews the species listed on schedules five and eight of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, for example, for Great Britain. Um, and that's a review of species which are uh, specially protected um, at, at the GB level. And one of the three eligibility criteria for assessing whether those species um, um, should be on the schedules of, of, of protection um, is of conservation status, but I'm not going to be going into the, uh, the details there. For habitats um, also, um, there are different ways of assessing conservation status of habitats, which has sort of progressed, I guess, in the last decade. And um, Ian Dieck from um, Nor uh, Nat uh, Natural England will speak later about red listing of European habitats. There's also wider European level assessment um, under uh, the European Commission's work on mapping and assessment of ecosystem services, um, which has been developing a wetland typology and a wetland layer, um, looking at the, uh, uh, the importance of, uh, of, of wetland ecosystems and peatlands at the European level. But my presentation is really focusing on assessing the conservation, of state, uh, conservation status of species and habitats uh, in the context of what is favourable conservation status um, under the uh, EU uh, Habitats and Birds Directives. Um, I guess the first slide, it's important to say what, what, what are the things that we're trying to meet. Um, first of all is the issue of scale. I think conservation status um, at the EU level was always defined as being the overall assessment of the status of a habitat or a species at the scale of the member states by a ge geographic or marine region. But I think conservation status can be assessed at any particular scale. It could be from site level, um, from country level, uh, UK level, right up to um, regional level, uh, uh, depending on the sort of uh, the, uh, the status of that species and, uh, or habitat and where they uh, occur. Um, Conservation status, I, I, I think in, in summary, is a situation where a habitat type or species is prospering in both quality and extent and po of, or extent of the habitat or, or population 
um, or, or in terms of the population. And it needs to have good prospects that will be continuing into the future. So they're elements of the present and also elements of the future. But still, how do we measure conservation status? Um, what is conservation status of habitats and how do you define what, uh, when a conservation uh, or, or when, a, when is a habitat favorable? Rather than going into all the detail, I just wanted to, to, to pick out some key things here about, it's looking at the natural range of that habitat and the areas it covers within that range and whether they're stable or increasing. So showing some positive um, uh, progress. It's looking at the specific structure and functions of those habitats um, and whether those structure and functions are likely to continue to exist in the foreseeable future. And it's also looking at the conservation status of the typical species of those habitats. From a species perspective, what is conservation status and how do you define uh, uh, how you're achieving uh, a favorable conservation status? It's looking at things like the population dynamics and whether the population is maintaining itself on a long-term basis, uh, whether the natural range of the species is being reduced um, or, or is uh, unlikely to be reduced in the future. And do you have a sufficiently large area of habitat to maintain the conservation status of that species and improve it through time? through things like restoration. Um, in terms of the Habitats Directive and Birds Directive reporting, we're, we're expected every six years to report on the Annex 1 habitats under the Habitats Directive. So that's very much habitat specific and includes specific Annex 1 peatland habitats. We also have to assess the conservation status of uh, annex, uh, species listed on the annexes of the uh, Habitats Directive as well. But they're obviously looking at uh, uh, um, uh, 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 conservation status of those species across their entire range. So not specifically habitats, uh, not habitat specific. And from the birds directive, we don't assess conservation status or, or assessing against a favorable conservation status threshold, but we assess the species status and trends of Annex 1 birds and also regularly occurring migrant, migrants. Um, again, we assess um, birds across their entire range and not necessarily habitat specific. So there's this interesting dynamic of things that we can actually hone down to particular habitat types, but also uh, species assessment of conservation is very much at, uh, at that sort of wider um, ecological scale. Okay, so just moving into um, some, some um, uh, the nitty gritty, I guess, of how conservation status is assessed at the UK level. Um, for habitat types and species. Um, this is very much the mechanism which was developed um, when we were part of the EU and all the 28, now 27 member states are, are, are set up to assess conservation status in their country at a biogeographical level. Um, for habitat types, we assess um, various uh, parameters. So we assess range, we assess area, we assess structure and functions, and we assess the future prospects of that habitat type. For species, we assess range, we assess population, the habitat for the species, and also the future prospects of those species. Each parameter is assessed as either favorable, unfavorable, inadequate, unfavorable, bad, or unknown. And there are also trends associated for the first three parameters for both habitats and species. So you're looking at the status and also the trend. And you're looking at current trends and you're also looking at future trends or future predicted trends based on the evidence. Range, area and population are all compared with what we call favorable reference values. They're basically functional thres thresholds for assessing and reporting conservation status against, a, for example, a historical baseline. So what was the, um, uh, you know, the population of a particular species or what was the area of a particular species at a particular time before uh, pressures were impacting on their conservation status. There's also a, th uh, a baseline set uh, as 1994, which was when the EU uh, was when the uh, UK uh, joined the EU and, and started implementing the Habitats Directive. So what we mustn't do is, uh, is have a range, an area or a population of a habitat or a species which goes below um, those 1994 levels. So it sets that benchmark of assessing how we're doing now uh, and do we need to get up to a particular level um, and uh, things through, through things like restoration. Going into a tiny little bit more detail on um, the, assess the assessment of habitats. So there are four parameters, as I said, 
Um, range is based on the occurrence of habitats within a 10 by 10 kilometer grid. Uh, um, for almost all habitats, this is favorable across the UK. You can see on the, um, the, uh, the map on the left, you've got the 10 by 10 kilometer grids, and then you create a range envelope map, which gives you um, a, um, a, an idea of, of how the range is uh, distributed across the UK um, and how that changes over time. That's what you do between conservation status assessments, which happen every six years. Area is the actual area or extent of the habitat. It's not distribution, but it's actually the, the numerical area of the, the habitat. Um, we also assess structure and functions, which is based on the statistics of habitat, um, of habitat condition, which are mostly based on the Common Standards Monitoring Framework, uh, which uh, the four countries of the UK use. This is also how typical species are counted for across, across the UK. So what are the typical species and the conservation status of those typical species within each individual habitat type? There's also um, a, a, a parameter called future prospects, and that future prospects is based on the prospect, future prospects for range, area and condition. And it's sort of a combination matrix of, 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 uh, of the assessment that goes on there. We also assess the contribution of the Natura 2000 network. Um, and I think the, the main purpose of that is to see if the conservation status is better, the same or worse within the Natura 2000 network than in the wider countryside. But generally you find that the contribution of the, the, of the statutory site network is providing additional protection um, to, uh, uh, to delivering uh, favourable conservation status or working towards favourable conservation status of a particular habitat feature or a species feature. Um, as I said, there is a, the concept of typical species as well. So that's assessing the status of the constituent species within the habitats, which is an important part of assessing condition and ecological integrity. We also have to deal with unknown, quite a lot of unknowns in, um, in our reporting as well. And in that, in, in that sense, it's when we don't know um, the full extent of a particular habitat type, for example, or we might not know what, the structure and what are the structure and functions of the habitat type across its entire range. So these, these are the challenges that we have to deal with. And I believe that Ian um, Dyack from Natural England uh, will be um, trying to describe the, some of the challenges there and how we're trying to address them through improved monitoring, et cetera. Uh, just to say one minute, please, Stephen. Okay. Thank you. Um, we also assess the uh, status of, of particular species. Uh, again, going through uh, the similar assessment for uh, four parameters. I'll move through that one quickly. Um, we then try to address all the different um, uh, assessments from the four parameters. So each parameter is, is described as either favourable, unfavourable and adequate, unfavourable and adequate, or unfavourable bad. And um, those assessments are then combined together or those conclusions are combined together to come up with um, a, a definition of whether the uh, overall assessment of that particular habitat or species is favorable, unfavorable, inadequate or unfavorable bad. Just as a summary of the 2000 and 19 reporting results. This just gives an indication that most of the peatland habitats across the UK are in unfavourable bad condition. Um, I think the key messages are that the status of some habitats have improved, but the improvements are marginal and most of the uh, peatland habitats are remaining unfavourable unfavorable bad. So we've got a real problem across the UK in terms of um, uh, particularly due to the structure and functions being in, in, in bad condition and the need that we need to restore that. But the, the, the reporting is starting to bring out that evidence. But we also are seeing some improvements, which is good news. And that means that over time, um, the, 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 the monitoring uh, is then being led into assessing the condition. And then the, the, the assessments are then feeding back uh, evidence into um, improving the management of, of those particular habitats and species. So it's that cl uh, classic sort of um, reporting, uh, monitoring and management cycle. Just flicking through to um, future reporting arrangements. Um, now we're leaving the EU, uh, just wanted to say what are we going to be doing in the future in terms of reporting. Um, uh, we are not going to be needing to report now to the European Commission on this six yearly cycle about how you assess conservation status. But there are obligations in the EU statutory um, instruments for England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and offshore that we will still need to uh, report on conservation status. Um, 
there are amendments, as I said, uh, into the habitat and species regulations. Um, uh, and what that's going to be doing is asking each of the countries to still carry on doing a country level report and then bring that data get together at a UK level in a UK composite report. And that will be provided to the Secretary of State for the Environment in DEFRA. Um, I think we just need to think about what those structures will be in the future and how we would do that reporting. And I think it's an opportunity to bring in elements of um, innovation, for example, um, things like ca uh, carbon accounting, uh, things about looking at um, how the structure of a particular habitat is distributed across um, the UK and the connectivity that needs to be improved from that sense. There's also international reporting under the Berne Convention, so there should be a there there, there will be a future reporting. It's likely to be similar reporting under the Berne Convention that we've been doing in the last 18 to 24 years under the Habitats and Birds Directive. And then other people have mentioned uh, in in the introductory comments this morning and introductory reports um, presentations about reporting at the international level. For example, under UNFCCC, the reporting under the CBD and the Ramsar Convention. And I think the final point is that the UK peatland programme and the UK peatland strategy are, 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 are really important in terms of gathering all the people together across the UK to, to try to, um, all the stakeholders, to bring all the monitoring data together so that we can improve our conservation status assessments across the UK in the future. Thanks very much. Lovely, Stephen. Thank you very much. Uh, that there was a lot to hear there that was that really needed hearing. And there'll be a lot of interest in uh, future arrangements post Brexit. I know. Can I just invite Ian Dyack to uh, get your presentation up and running, please, Ian? And just a reminder to colleagues on the conference: do please submit questions via the Q and A tab. Uh, okay, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Are you able to look at chat? If I can just give you a two-minute warning towards the end. Or yeah, uh, can you see yeah. my? Yeah, yeah. I told it to, but um, it's taken a while. <laughs> Anything else you can try, or uh, mm -hmm. kind of your full screen now? We could, what, you mean jump in and come oh, back sorry, to him? Wait a minute. Is that working? There we are. Okay. Thank you, Ian. Over to you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Pete. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Ian Dyack. I work for Natural England as um, Senior Specialist for Terrestrial Wetlands in the Chief Scientists team. And I am going to be talking about peatland habitats and plants and the work that we've been doing on Annex 1 inventories in England. So not addressing the whole of the UK, just for England. So following on from um, Stephen's talk, I can't get this slide to work. Has the slide changed? Okay, that's that oh, there, there we go. No, it has. Yeah, yeah thank sorry you, about Ian. that. Okay, no, don't right. Worry. Sorry to pick up here. Um, moving on from Stephen's, uh, what Stephen was talking about, um, the Article 17 reporting is something that we we do every six years, and we look at the seven different peatland habitats. Now, one of the purposes that that monitoring has been put to at a European scale for the first time in 2016 was to establish a European red list of habitats. Um, and so this was done 2016, various experts from around Europe, we, we contributed, the um, various habitat specialists from the statutory agencies contributed and the, the, the main component of that was the Article 17 monitoring. So we're looking at the peatland component of that, Myers and Boggs came out as the most threatened group of habitats across Europe. And if you just look at this table here, you can see that 85% of Maya types within Europe are in a highly threatened category, 
which probably comes as no surprise to any of us. Um, yeah, compared compared to the others, the grassland is you know fifty three percent. Um, so that's in the critical and critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable categories based on loss and threat to those habitats. So a very bad picture for uh, peatlands as reflected also in what Stephen was reporting. When you look at the detail of that assessment, there um, you look at the endangered, so you know the second highest level of threat based on a yeah, very high level of loss and continued threat. Some of our most, you know, the, the England level is is well represented there. Raised bogs, endangered alkaline fens, endangered and tall calcareous fen particularly, and then looking at vulnerable, which you know is 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 not far off being endangered. Oceanic valley bogs, which is sort of the Valley Maya systems, New Forest, typically associated with heathlands in this country. Acid fen, which we kind of tend not to spend too much time worrying about. And various other kind of habitats that we know are highly threatened in this country at quaking bogs. Um, I've also added in here sort of non Maya categories, but also uh, occurring on peat shallow peat very often, particularly moist and wet mesotrophic grasslands, which is the kind of millennia meadow that we know about. And in, in the vulnerable, we've got wet heath as well as woodlands on peat. So, you know, a, a pretty sorry state at Europe and at England scale. So thinking about, okay, well, what do we know about these habitats in England? We obviously we know some stuff and why, why would we need to inventory an inventory for these things, which people ask, you say, well, you've got priority habitats, what, what do you need to know all this for? Obviously, if you don't know where things are, you can't assess their condition or their state. You can't understand why they occur in certain places and you can't uh, convey to the people who may have lots of that habitat in their particular area that it's of you know, international significance. It helps ensure conservation. If you've got this on a map that could be used for planning or other purposes, and we've got you know, recent examples of where the absence of particular habitats from an inventory has led to damage. This has been the um, infamous barrier case in Cumbria on the right. And obviously it can help focus restoration, particularly if you can record where the habitat used to occur, which we have tried to do. So we've got priority habitat inventories, but um, are they not good enough? Well, actually, I've, uh, having been involved in this for quite a long time, I've said the priority habitats don't tell us very much about wetlands in detail. They, lowland fens, for instance, encompasses everything from kind of very eutrophic nettle and reed bed through to you know, almost bog type habitat or very short alkaline fen, purple moorgrass and rush pasture is the type of fen. These in green, these are all min mineratrophic peatlands. Uh, in red, umbratrophic wetlands and lowland heath and upland heath obviously occur on peat as well. In certain situations, we've got this sort of artificial split between lowland and upland. So they're not great for telling us about the health of our habitats. So we've, over the last 10 years or so, been developing much more detailed inventories based on the Annex 1 habitats largely. And so I'm just going to show you some uh, results from those uh, projects, starting with alkaline fen, which is an incredibly rich habitat and obviously one of the most threatened habitats in Europe, tend to be very small, associated with groundwater outflows. But um, yeah, very species rich, both botanically and uh, in terms of uh, invertebrate fauna as well. Uh, what we found looking at the alkaline fence, which we hadn't done previously, was that we have around 2000 hectares of this habitat in England. The vast majority is in the uplands on calcareous rock or in, in the lakes on uh, more kind of volcanic rocks, which contain quite a lot of base enrichment. In the lowlands, 
we have got a vanishingly small extent of alkaline fen left, something like 40 hectares. Um, many of these sites are less than 0.1 of a hectare and are kind of besieged on all sides by fairly hostile land uses. Um, so this just flagged up how threatened and rare these things are. And we've mapped this now, and you know, that, that gives us a great basis to try to protect these properly. It's worth saying that 82% of these sites were in triple SIs, um, but 400 sites at least are not protected uh, in triple SIs, including some in the lowlands. So that obviously gives us a, a there's a real priority there to, to notify these sites to protect them. This just highlights the kind of proportions of the different types of alkaline fen. The M10 being the more upland representation with lots of brown mosses and common butterware and daisha sedge. Um, the M13 is the low, more lowland variety of that, of which there is such a small amount as of the total proportion and highly threatened. Um, Transition mire and quaking bog is quite a difficult habitat to um, define, but we, we, we did it through this project and there are various different sorts that are included within the uh, category. Again, this showed that there's something you know, around between 2,000 to 3,000 hectares nationally, so you know, not a common habitat. Lots in the new forest, uh, like again, Cumbria, has a lot of it and again I think this was a, a, a revelation a lot of the valley mire systems in Cumbria very rich wetlands uh, Midlands mirrors and mosses an important spot for it and the Norfolk broads and some of the other uh, Norfolk wetlands um, the the third type we looked at was calcareous fens with cladium. And if you look, think back to the uh, red list, tall calcareous fens, this is this kind of roughly accords with that. So this is another endangered habitat within Europe. Again, never mapped comprehensively. And again, I mean, this is, there's even less of this, there's about 500 hectares, and that's a fairly broad uh, interpretation of the habitat. This map shows its distribution, massive concentration in the Norfolk Broads, the classic um, tall herb flowery fen, also some of the Little Ooze headwaters and some of the Ed Breckland edge fens there as well. It has been, it has occurred in um, other parts of the country in the past and particularly around Morecambe Bay, they used to be a lot more. So this, this starts to give you some idea of where you can restore this. We know that the Morecambe Bay area holds some, the Somerset levels would have also supported a huge area of this before it was drained and uh, managed as more intensive farmland. There's just a quick picture of some sort of tall herb, not particularly species rich fen, but showing the kind of core um, saw sedge, Cladium mariscus species and a bit of uh, marsh pea as well. Again, highly dependent on calcareous groundwater to support it. Uh, sorry, that. Ian, just one minute, please. Okay. Um, the what what the Annex One inventory has shown us so far is you know that we, we've we've discovered a lot of new sites, um, but there's still habitats we know very little about and one of those being intermediate fen and soft water spring mires which was listed as vulnerable we have these in this country we don't recognize them they support rare species including this this moss here um hematocornus vernicosis which is a schedule 8 and annex 2 species so in general mire types in the english uplands are not well recorded and we need to do a lot better um Obviously, you're losing habitat, you're losing the species that are supported in those. And this just highlights some of the um, core typical wetland species from peat, from oh, peatland species, which are again showing that huge declines as picked up in the vascular red list for England. And going back to Stephen's point about typical species having to be in good condition in order to achieve favorable conservation status, 
we've got a huge amount of work to do in order to restore these to uh, uh, lower levels of threat. This just shows the kind of loss of bog sedge, one of those from England. This shows its current distribution, although we have got a few new sites and that was its previous distribution pre-1990. So you can see a bit lost from huge parts of the country. Next steps, we need to continue updating these Annex 1 inventories. These are living documents and you know that we need to keep them live and added to. Going to need to look at raised bogs inventory. It's we found new sites. Um, these need to be added. Other Maya types, all much less well known. We need to look at those, particularly in the uplands. Um, you know, we need to know these things quickly because we've got money for peatland restoration, um, and we need to be focusing on some of these of the richest sites. And a final slide just to highlight the interlinked nature of these things and the importance of looking at the whole system and looking at the catchment and looking at natural function. This is Crag Luff, just next to the Hadrian's Wall in Northumberland. It's a sack site for various things and it's exceptionally rich. And most of these habitats depend on one thing and that is restoring the natural hydrological function in this landscape and removing pressures. So we've got a mesotrophic lake. We've got quaking calcareous fern around the outside as it's starting to terrestrialize. We've got a raised bog, which has taken that on the next stage of terrestrialization. We've got transition mires up here. We've got damaged millennia meadow and wet heath on shallow peat on the slopes. And we've also got the border mires just to the north, which is all that Sitka spruce, which are probably the best peatlands in England. This whole system is quite damaged, even though we look at it and think it's really rich. The lake is lowered by about a metre. We need to think about all of these things, not just look at our little habitats, look at it uh, as a whole and sort out the whole landscape in order to achieve our peatland restoration goals. I'll stop there. Lovely job. Thank you very much, Ian. We're going to go straight into the streamed videos at this point. Uh, do please keep the questions coming. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name's Simon Watson from um, RSPB. Um, I work in the monitoring section of um, the Conservation Science Department. My talk this morning um, is going to be a general talk on bird monitoring with specific reference to some of the key um, peatland birds. It's an overview of um, uh, breeding bird monitoring in the UK, um, the breeding bird survey organised by BTO um, produces UK trends for roughly 117 species. Um, around 30 or so species are covered by what's been known as the Statutory Conservation Agencies and RSPB Annual Breeding Bird Survey or Scarabs. Um, and a number of um, other rare species are are covered by the Rare Breeding Birds Panel, which produces geo-reference records for around 100 species per year. So a list of some of the key peatland um, birds in the UK with their sort of level of uh, monitoring, um, with many of these species covered by regular um, scarab surveys, and only a couple, um, curly and to a lesser extent, golden plover covered by the Breeding Bird Survey. On to common scoter, um, there have been two scarab surveys for common scoter um, in 1995 and 2007, um, with a near 50% uh, decline in the Scottish population between these um, two surveys. Um, signs of a recent recovery in Ireland with um, 50 potential breeding pairs recorded in 2020 um, compared to 39 um, in the previous survey in 2012. Um, there are a number of factors to consider um, with common scoter. Um, there are potential unknown impacts from wind farms located between breeding locks in the sea, which could affect foraging, migration and survival. Um, fragmentation of the landscape may be important as the scoter population uses the landscape as one unit when moving around. Um, also mentioned here some recent ongoing research on the breeding population in Scotland looking at um, um, uh, 
the lakes used by breeding scoters and the, their characteristics. On to curly, which is one of the UK's um, highest conservation priority bird species. No, um, the species is globally near threatened um, and the UK breeding population is of global importance with nearly 30% of the uh, global population breeding in the UK. <coughs> Uh, roughly, um, well, over 75% of the um, global population um, breeds in Northern Europe. It's been a rapid decline in curly um, numbers since the mid 1990s um, across the UK, and um, the species is now red listed on the UK's birds conservation concern. The BBS trends for the UK and Scotland show a long term decline since the start of the BBS in 1994. Um, for England, using common bird census, common bird census survey data, um, there's a longer term trend and the decline, uh, it shows that the decline started in around the mid 1970s, at least in England. There have been a number of uh, recent and ongoing regional studies um, for breeding curly, um, no, including um, studies testing the combination of habitat management and predator control required to stabilise the breeding population. There have been a number of regular um, scarab surveys for golden eagle, but the um, species is also well monitored by the, uh, annually by the Scottish Raptor Study Group. The last national scarab survey was in 2015, which showed a 50% increase um, since 2003. The surveys in 1982, 1992 and 2003 showed a, um, uh, a similar population estimates. The density map shows the um, uh, the importance of the flow country in terms of um, the uh, the density of pairs per hundred kilometer squares, and shows the um, the greater distribution in the Western Highlands and uh, in the Western Isles. On to golden plover, um, there was really no annual monitoring um, of the breeding population before the breeding bird survey. But for Scotland and the UK as a whole, um, the breeding bird survey trend shows stability or possibly a minor decrease. There have been a number of studies involving breeding golden plover uh, in peatland habitats in recent years, um, including on the effects of um, wind farms, uh, where displacement was shown to occur up to a distance of 200 metres from turbines, and there was on average a 39% reduction in density within 500 metres of turbines. Um, golden plover was also one of the species um, within the RSPB organised repeat upland bird survey. Um, one of the key findings was that changes in abundance were negatively related with extent of proximate forest edge habitat. On to hen harrier, hen harrier which has been um, uh, covered by a number of scarab surveys since the late 1980s. Um, the last scarab survey was in 2016, um, when nearly 550 territorial pairs were recorded in the UK, with another 30 in the Isle of Man. Um, between 2016 and the previous survey in 2010, um, there were declines in all four um, UK countries. Um, hen hair is another species <coughs> that is relatively well monitored um, through annual monitoring by the um, Scottish Raptor Study Group. Uh, on to a couple of other species which um, are, are, are of some importance for um, um, in terms of uh, peatland habitats and I thought worth mentioning here. Um, red grouse is well covered um, through the Breeding Bird Survey uh, and the trend but Although the trend shows fluctuations, there's been no overall um, positive or negative trend since 1994. Uh, red grouse is amber listed in the UK birds conservation concern um, due to uh, long term declines revealed by um, analysis of um, historical shooting bags. Uh, on a slightly different topic, I'll mention bitterns here, which have been monitored uh, the booming males have been monitored annually since 1990. Um, the uh, increase in the um, 
increase at least since 2008 has been driven by the recolonization or colonization of sites in in former peat workers particularly in Somerset in the Fens um, uh, with the population now um, at or over um, 200 booming males compared to a low point of um, 11 booming males in 1997. Uh, just a couple of um, slightly different uh, topics to finish on. Um, uh, brief summary of the um, Sustainable Catchment Management Programme, otherwise known as SCAMP, um, which aimed to improve SSSI condition status, benefit biodiversity and improve raw water quality through a number of um, uh, management trials um, at two sites, uh, two United Utility sites in Bowens in the Peak District. Um, there were breeding bird surveys in four, um, four years uh, and the conclusions from this work show that scamp management had a positive effect for five species, including three peatland waders, golden plover, dunlin and curlew. Um, and the overall conclusion suggests that management for ecosystem services, in this case water quality, can benefit biodiversity. Just going to finish off on um, uh, an overview of the Scotland Upland Bird Indicator which was recently updated to um, include 2018 data. The upland bird indicator of Scotland includes 17 species uh, with data for 10 of these species from the breeding bird survey, five from scarab surveys and two from other BTO surveys. Um, five of these species showed a decline of more than 50% since 1994 uh, with four other, others in significant long-term decline. Um, of the species increasing, uh, both raven and curly um, populations increased by more than 130% since 1994. Um, but this shows the uh, overall value of, um, uh, of regular monitoring uh, of a number of um, uh, species in this context. Okay, and that's the end of my talk. Thanks very much. Thank you for asking me to speak here today. My name is Clay McAdam, and I'm Conservation Director for Bug Life and Invertebrate Conservation Trust. Today I'm going to speak to you about why bogs are important for invertebrates. But first I'd like to give you an introduction to Bug Life. Bug Life is the only organisation in Europe dedicated to the conservation of all invertebrates, from mayflies to millipedes, spiders to starfish. Our aim is to halt invertebrate extinctions and achieve sustainable populations of invertebrates in the UK and further afield. We do this through a range of activities, including inspiring others by getting out there and showing them bugs and their habitats at first hand, by shaping policy and influencing decision makers to make the right choices to benefit bugs, by raising awareness of the importance of invertebrates and the challenges that face them, and finally by undertaking practical conservation work to benefit bugs and their habitat. So when we look at a bog, what do people see? Well, they see sphagnum. And rightly so, as the building blocks for the peat formation, these mosses are incredibly important. But bogs are about far more than just sphagnum. There seems to be a widely held belief that bogs are poor for invertebrates, but that couldn't be further from the truth. As this illustration by Daisy Whittick shows, bogs are much more than just sphagnum. They teem with wildlife of all sizes, from tiny water beetles to adders, and hen harriers and roe deer. Both blanket bogs and lowland raised bogs have a unique assemblage of invertebrate species associated with them. These tables list the number of species of conservation concern, the species that have been listed in red data books or status reviews, which are associated with lowland raised bogs and blanket bogs. I've not included butterflies and moths, as so I'll leave that topic to my colleagues from Butterfly Conservation. But as you can see, there are a wide range of other species with conservation statuses. 51 species from blanket bogs and 63 from lowland raised bog. The main groups of interest are the flies and the beetles and also spiders on blanket bogs. And here's a selection of those species. Going from left to right on the top row we have the large heath butterfly, the bog pseudoscorpion and the bog sun jumper spider. In the middle row we have the micromoth lampronia fuscatella, the bog reed beetle, and the white-faced darter dragonfly. And on the bottom row, we have the Rannoch brindle beauty moth, 
Fogbush Griffith and the Windlewing Sedge, which is a caddis fly. I'd like to give you some details of the monitoring that we've been carrying out on a peatland restoration project in central Scotland. This is the project site, a 210 hectare lowland raised bog called Fannyside Muir, which is located near Cumbernauld between Edinburgh and Glasgow. The site has historically been mined for peat and, other, and, and further damaged by planting of commercial conifer forests. And the aim of the project was to restore the bog and bring back favourable conditions for invertebrates that lived there. We did this um, using several different interventions. Over 4,300 dams were installed in drainage ditches to retain water in the bog and allow recovery of peat forming sphagnum mosses. Over 30 hectares of conifer and 54 hectares of birch scrub and gorse were also removed uh, to prevent damage to the bog surface which contribute to its drying. At this point I also want to acknowledge the work of my colleague Scott Shanks who led this work for Bug Life and also the funders, which was the EU Life um, Fund, uh, Scottish Natural Heritage and the Wren Landfall Trust. This is a typical ditch on the bog before restoration. It's deep and in wet weather flows down here, taking it away from the peat that needs it. On this particular ditch we installed sheet piling dams, which were reinforced with wooden braces. And this is the result. The water is held back and over time will occlude with sphagnum regrowth. Almost immediately behind the diggers, we saw black dart dragonflies laying their eggs in the pools that formed behind the dams. 26 hectares of the driest and most degraded parts of Fannyside Muir have also been cell bunded. A deep trench is dug in the peat on four sides and the excavated peat is then compressed into the trench, leaving a bund slightly higher than the surface of the bog. This creates a 20 by 20 metre cell and this cell blocks small ditches and cracks in the peat, which disrupts the subsurface water flow and forms a shallow pool on the surface of the bog. The pool is quickly colonised by cotton grass and, and later sphagnum, and the result is absolutely incredible. Dragonflies and wading birds have colonised these pools almost immediately. A key part of this project was to think of the peatland restoration from an invertebrate point of view. Whilst the primary aim was to re-wet the peatland. We also wanted to understand more about what invertebrates were using the, the site and how they reacted to the restoration work. Scott undertook a variety of surveys during the project and amassed a huge number of biological records. 835 species recorded in total, covering vascular plants, birds, uh, mammals, lichens and of course invertebrates. Over 550 species of invertebrate have been recorded so far. These include over 200 species of butterfly and moth, nearly 100 fly species, 87 beetle species, 34 species of bees, wasps and ants, and 38 species of true bug and 9 dams flying dragonfly species. With over 500 species of invertebrate, it's impossible to monitor everything. So we need to identify some indicator groups or species that have well-established monitoring protocols that we can use to monitor the bog. The first we employed was butterfly transit walks. Unfortunately, we don't have the large heath butterfly at Fannyside, but butterflies such as the large heath are important indicators of habitat quality and can be monitored quite easily by following a set route over the site, observing butterfly species on either side of the path and, and making notes of their numbers. In a similar fashion, we can monitor the re-wetting of the peatland by looking at the colonisation of dragonfly species, in particular the black darter. We can employ the same transect techniques as those for butterflies, but focus on the network of blocked ditches for the route of the transect and make notes of the number of uh, individuals that we're seeing along that route. And finally, we can look at indicators of habitat quality and connectivity. In contrast to the large heath and black darter, which can disperse across a site by flying, the bog beetle Agonum erociti is flightless and therefore relies on dispersing along the ground. To do so, it needs good habitat quality, um, which is connected across the site by using. Uh, so, so it needs good habitat across the full site um, for it to be able to disperse. By using pitfall traps, we can investigate the abundance and density of this ground beetle and therefore the habitat quality and connectivity of the site. 
I'd like to finish off with some recommendations. Back in 2018, as part of the Ecoco Life project, we were part of an EU Life platform meeting, which looked at how to get more work for invertebrates in life projects. Whilst this meeting looked at more than just peatland projects, several of the recommendations that were made are relevant to the discussion today. The first two recommendations relate to the assessment of habitat quality and the need for the projects to have an element of invertebrate monitoring, as I've described earlier, using either indicator species or functional groups and not just looking at the bryophyte community as an indicator of habitat quality. The other main recommendation is that when you're planning a project, you should involve invertebrate experts, invertebrate specialists, at the very start of the project, at the project design stage, to ensure that monitoring is incorporated from the beginning and that habitat features such as bog pools are incorporated wherever possible. Unfortunately, I can't be there for the panel discussion, but if anyone would like to ask me a question, please get in touch by email. Further information on all our work on bogs and other habitats can be found on the Bug Life website. Thank you for listening. Hi everyone. Today I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing, exploring whether getting a handle on microbial processes in peatlands um, can help us to make progress on the restoration and understanding resilience um, of peatland systems. So this is work that's been funded under the, under the NERC UK Climate Resilience Programme. And what we were trying to do was bring together peatland scientists, microbial ecologists and practitioners, um, people with the multidisciplinary skills <coughs> that we need to investigate um, the role that microbes have as a, as a mechanistic control on the climate regulation function of peatlands. So what we're trying to do is unlock this black box that the, the microbial decomposition and respiration of organic, organic matter, which links peatland conditions with, in this case, the function, which is the greenhouse gas balance. And we know that in, in this case, water table here driving CO2 and methane balances um, controls um, to some degree or is well correlated um, with this relationship so we can develop empirical transfer functions. But actually, if you set out to answer the question, why does water table um, impact on gas flux? It's because water table impacts on rates of microbial decomposition and respiration and, and that drives greenhouse gas balance. So scientists are perennial two-year-olds. They always want to answer the question, why? So to understand why here, we have to know more about the microbial black box. And as we, as we begin to explore this link between peatland function and, in this, and climate regulation, um, then we can see that a key part of the, the resilience of peatlands to um, changing climate is driven by these um, microbial processes and supported potentially by the restoration um, of peatlands. And of course, the restoration of peatlands is going on apace across um, the UK, particularly in the uplands here. We're up on Kinder Scout, um, looking at transformation from bare peat to um, fairly healthy growing sphagnum um, in parts of the system over 10 years. So these are systems where um, it's useful to understand both the microbial change that is driven by this restoration, but also the role of um, microbial processes in supporting that transformation. So to try and get at this, we, we held four workshops in Manchester between May and February. We got in just ahead of lockdown, um, looking at peatland function, microbial processes, modeling, remote sensing, and, and the application um, of that knowledge to uh, practical restoration work. So the outcomes included um, a state of the science review um, where we concluded that actually there was a reasonably good understanding of peatland microbial diversity, data on the relative roles of fungi, bacteria and archaea, um, but a less well-developed understanding of that key link between diversity and function and very little data on understanding the short-term variability of microbial processes, um, which of course is important because peatlands are systems that don't only respond to long-term 
um, drivers, but for example, you know, water table responds over timescales of 24 hours to, to storm events. So that, that's a big absence um, in, in our understanding. And together with the concepts of functional redundancy and dormancy, it means that there is a real decoupling of our um, understanding of microbial taxonomy from um, peatland function. And functional redundancy is, is the concept that lots of um, microbes may deliver a particular function. So there may be lots of microbes in a peatland that um, secrete the enzyme that degrades um, lignin to cellulose, for example. Um, and that means there isn't necessarily a clear link from particular species um, to, to that function. And similarly, um, the concept of dormancy, if we look at a peatland, not all of the microbes that are identified by genetic characterization might actually be active. Um, some of them may be in a dormant state waiting for appropriate water table or redox um, conditions to become active. And so that, that really does decouple um, this, this link and make it more difficult for us to understand it. And so to get at those links, um, the suggestion is that rather than looking at um, taxonomic diversity, there's, there's more work beginning to look at um, diversity of microbial traits or phenotypes. So looking at diversity of metabolic capabilities, for example, of peatlands. And we need more studies of that diversity, um, functional rather than taxonomic, using approaches like metagenomics, where we're not looking at the, uh, the genome of an organism, but we're looking at the genome of um, environmental material, maybe a sample of peatland soil, for example. And rapid advances in genetic techniques mean that this is work that can't be done by generalists anymore. It can only be done by interdisciplinary teams of um, microbial um, geneticists uh, together with peatland scientists. We, we also um, have recently published in Science of the Total Environment a commentary piece um, which came from the workshops and came particularly from attempts in those workshops to prioritize research questions. And, and so we've, we've prioritized high, medium and low uh, priority research questions. The high priority questions are the big questions, you know, are there links between microbial communities um, and net carbon sink and source sites? Can we define keystone groups or functional groups um, that, that define ideal states of peatlands? Can we intervene in peatland restoration through inoculation to promote um, ideal or desirable um, uh, peatland microbial communities? So the high priority questions are the big ones about how we, we, we use understanding of um, microbial communities to drive peatland resilience. And underneath a, a set of lower um, priority questions, um, which nevertheless are important because they, obviously, they are often kind of steps along the way to, to answering the, these high priority questions. Um, out of workshop four came a co-produced um, policy brief, um, looking at many of these questions and particularly thinking about how we can link to um, peatland restoration practice. And um, this comes from the policy brief. And it's a diagram that identifies short, medium and long-term goals. Short-term goals we thought involve characterizing microbial communities in different peatland states, degraded states, pristine states, restored states, understanding uplands and lowlands and so on. And that's gonna require more monitoring across a range of sites. And in the medium term, that potentially leads to this goal of defining what a best case um, healthy microbial community might look like. And, and one thing that might fall out of that is the possibility to use the, the microbial community, to use genetic characterizations of microbial communities as monitoring tools in restoration projects. You know, can rather than going out and monitoring water tables um, over, over time, could we instead um, be doing rapid assays of, of um, genetic character um, of the microbial community to assess how far we are towards that best case, best case restoration um, community. 
and in the long term, can we actually begin to manipulate that, that process? Can we nudge microbial communities along towards that ideal state to kickstart restoration, maybe by inoculating um, with, um, with um, communities from um, pristine sites or, or so on? Uh, and to get to that, we're going to need to do more uh, manipulation restorations in the field. So we think there's a, there's a huge potential here um, that uh, a better understanding of microbial processes can take us um, along a road to um, being able to restore and characterize um, and support resilient peatlands and the role that resilient peatlands play in climate regulation. Obviously, there's lots more detail than I've been able to go over in 10 minutes here. I'd encourage you to go and look at our peatlandmicrobes.com website where all the publications that I've um, described here today um, are available um, and of course happy to take questions in the question session at the end of end of this um, at the end of this talk thank you very much good morning I hope that most if not all of you will remember the carbon and nature story map that the RSPB produced last year we've been developing that with a new peat focus story map released last month and forestry and coastal ones to follow in the coming weeks. Last year's story map showed that there are 545 million tonnes of carbon stored in the top 30 centimetre soils and in the vegetation of our nature rich areas and that's equivalent to four times the UK's annual greenhouse gases. The green graph on the, the green map on the right. But two thirds of that carbon has no form of designation or other protection. That's the red map on the left. Our new story map takes this analysis a little further and it looks at all the peat soils in the UK, including the lowland farmland ones. Looking across the four UK countries, there's a similar story of very poor condition, around 80% in poor condition, varying a little across the countries. Northern Ireland just beats England with the worst proportion degraded, and Wales has the best proportion in near natural or rewetted condition. The greenhouse gas implications of this are massive 23.1 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, and that's the same as 5% of the UK's total greenhouse gas emissions every year, and more than all of our heavy goods vehicles on our roads. So it's clear we must stop damaging our bogs. From drainage across a range of sustainable management, from farming, forestry and game management. From burning, which has gained a lot of attention recently, um, and it's great to see Scotland's announcement of an end to burning on peatland. And in England, Rebecca Powell's robust conclusion of the Westminster Hall debate. And yet burning is a means to an end, and whilst the RSPB wants a legislative end, it must be on the route to blanket bog restoration and not to the perpetuation of upland heather grouse deserts by rotational cutting. Lowland agriculture is the source of the UK's peatlands highest carbon losses and in many areas the physical soil loss is now causing concern to those whose livelihoods depend upon it. So that's encouraging to see shoots of change, particularly in East Anglia. Our forested bogs release nearly a thousand times as much greenhouse gases as near natural bogs. The carbon stored in all that timber does not counteract these losses. The delivery of forestry targets is a major concern for peatlands and it needs to be addressed appropriately. Our forthcoming mapping work next month will provide a key resource towards this. And peat extraction. It's shocking that this, that this not just continues despite clear targets set in England in 2011 that the gardening industry has failed to meet, but there continue to be new planning applications and even an appeal against one that was turned down by the operator at Lockwood Moss in Dumfries and Galloway, which is current. So it's clear what we must do. We must restore our peatland habitat and we must transition our lowland farming and repurpose our peatlands there towards a wetland farming and economic uses that are in harmony with nature. Doing this, we can stop more than 19 million tonnes of CO2 of greenhouse gas emissions every year if we do this properly, 
regenerating bog habitat, such as the slide at uh, Bolton Fell Moss on the left, and through developing polluticulture, as, sh as shown through this earliest trial at the Great Fen in Cambridgeshire. Now, while it's fantastic to see the restoration and regeneration that's being done, very encouraging, it is way below what's required, as this pie chart shows. The green band of restoration is around 4% of the total, with three quarters requiring attention. So a huge upscaling effort is required, taking the expertise on the ground, matching it with strategic delivery and proper funding. And in England, we've estimated that means between one third and two thirds of the £640 million Nature for Carbon fund. And this graph shows our policy shortfall, with even the Committee on Climate Change's ambitions decidedly short of the mark. The top line shows business as usual. The next two down, the CCC's medium and high ambitions for peatland restoration. The bottom line shows the cumulative emissions um, of uh, full restoration. And this does include lowland agricultural peatlands as well. And to put this in the context of the much talked about tree planting targets, if we don't restore peatlands, all of those extra trees that the CCC has recommended, they'll just mop up between one third and two thirds of the greenhouse gases that's been lost from our degraded peatlands at today's level of peatland condition. And this is for achieving the high ambition woodland targets. You'll also see that the mixed deciduous woodland offers a much better climate mitigation benefit than the production forestry. So that's the yellow curve at the bottom, producing much more or much fewer cumulative emissions than does the, um, produ high, the production forestry on the green line. Our story map then delves into case studies across the UK, looking at both successes and problems. There's also a resume of the situation on the ground and a critique of policy in each of the four countries, but I don't have time to touch on those now. In England, our case studies look at the RSPB and United Utilities partnership, which is successfully restoring Dovestone high above Manchester. With Sphagnum re-establishing and, and blossoming numbers of curlews, dunlin and golden plovers, along with saving nearly 7,000 tonnes of CO2 um, of greenhouse gases every year. And at Geltsdale, with the RSPB and the North Pennines AOMB Peatscapes project. Here also the speed of improvement in habitat quality and bird numbers has pleasantly surprised. Our case studies in Northern Ireland look at the removal of 30 hectares of forestry at Tully Churry Forest on the edge of the Pettigo Plateau in Fermanagh, and at the restoration of almost 500 hectares of the Garonne Plateau in Antrim, which is ending almost 2,000 tonnes of CO2 emissions a year and showcasing nature, carbon and water benefits to other landowners to encourage wider take up of restoration. For Scotland, we look at the RSPB's ongoing work at Forcinard, where trees over 2,600 hectares of a forested bog have now been cleared and the hydrology restored. We also look at commercial peat extraction, with around half a million cubic metres of peat extracted annually from 14 sites in Scotland, accounting for two thirds of the UK's peat production and producing nearly 20,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent every year. Last but not least, Wales. Our story map takes us to Lake Vernwy, where the RSPB is working in collaboration with Harfran de Frudery, Natural Resources Wales and local farmers to restore the peatlands surrounding the lake from forestry and inappropriate agriculture. And we also look at NRW's Life Welsh Raised Bog project across seven sites and 900 hectares, which comprises um, around half of this habitat in Wales. That's around 900 hectares. Our story map concludes with broad policy messages which are pertinent across all the countries. Our world of twin crises for nature and for climate change requires greater commitment, investment and action to restore peatlands and to use our peat soils in sustainable ways. There are different, differing levels of policy development and commitment in each of the four UK countries. Yet none manages, matches the needs of our rather desperately degraded and de peatland depleted peatland world. None yet provides the springboard to gain the benefits that we should be getting from our healthy peatlands for climate, 
for nature and for people. Overarching the detail required in each country's approach, the RSPB asks that our governments take urgent steps to protect and restore our peatland habitat resource, to set country targets for restoration and rewetting of peat to halt greenhouse ga gas emissions that are in line with achieving net zero targets, to invest in peatlands restoration as part of the green recovery and to, to create jobs in the delivery of practical peatland action, to end the burning of vegetation on peatland through legislation, to continue to prevent tree planting on deep peat and to restore a for a forested peatlands, to prevent tree planting, planting on organomineral soils such as shallow peat unless both nature and carbon benefits can be demonstrated. To ban the extraction, retail sales and use of peat for gardening and horticulture. And to develop and incentivise economic uses that are compatible with the sustainable management of farmed peat and soils and change our approach to water management in these areas. So do please find our new peatland story map on the internet. We hope it's a useful resource for all. It shows, in short, that we need a step change to revitalising our peatlands for all the benefits they could give and should be giving us. And we need to do this rapidly, so let's get on with it. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Ollie, and thank you to all the presenters from this from this uh, second session of the morning. Uh, really interesting range of uh, talks and issues there. Uh, I think we've all got our cameras on. Um, many thanks to Melissa Shaw for being here in place of Craig McAdam for the questions. Uh, so I've been uh, keeping track of the uh, questions coming in. Um, so um, one's got uh, a really large number of votes, so I think we'll probably um, we'll probably start with that one. Um, and this question, it's it's visible on the Q and A uh, chat thing. It's all to do with habitat status assessments, and mostly based on quite subjective vegetation cover. Should we not move on to include actual measurable ecosystem functions? such as carbon accumulation, et cetera, which links plant soil processes. There might be plenty of surprises. I think that's a really good question. I wonder, could Stephen, could I ask you to kick that one off, please? Thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, I think I alluded just towards the end of my presentation about the, um, I think, what you could describe as, as um, a robust methodology of assessing um, status. Um, but it could be much broader, I think. And um, I think in the in the conservation status assessment reports, they're very you know they're very much focused from a, um, a species specific and a, and a habitat specific focus. But they don't really look at all the underlying um, elements that are integrated within um, peatland conservation and and how to improve um, you know the condition of particular peatland habitats through rewetting etc. As we heard, um, for example, in Ollie's last presentation, um, and 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 all the elements about microbial um, processes um, we heard as well in in. Um, in, in Martin's presentation. So um, I think we could look at um, uh, assessing um, condition and um, conservation status using a whole raft of, 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 of more integrated um, approaches. Um, and also as Ian um, uh, noted in the final slide of his presentation about um, all the different um, integrated elements within, for example, like a river basin or within a catchment, um, looking at uh, the carbon um, and um, yeah, looking at the water processes that are going on. So um, yes, I sort of um, think that, that, that there are maybe opportunities of, of thinking about um, broadening the way that we assess um, uh, peatland habitats, yeah, and the species associated with them. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Ollie, I just wondered, would you like, because this uh, this had a strong tie over to your talk as well, is this, I don't know if you can see the question or if you want me to repeat it, it's the one that got 11, 11 likes. Oh, yes, I can't see the question, but I think I can remember. Yeah, absolutely, and as the policy world is driving us a little bit more in other directions too, so the monitoring world needs to reflect that, I think, um, and the policy driver for a lot of for the investment in peatlands is uh, for carbon. So we really need to understand that properly. 
uh, particularly if we're, if we're increasingly wanting to sell that carbon to the public, um, to public funding, which or, or private funding rather, which, which we clearly need to do. Um, we have to be absolutely sure about what we're doing. Let's also be clear though, um, and in this dash for climate, let's not forget that our peoples are wonderful nature places as well. So I see this more as an adjunct rather than a replacement of the things that we're doing at the moment. Okay, thank you, Ollie. I'm. Uh, this is um, this is stretching my multi-tasking uh, abilities to the very limit. This having to look at two screens at the same time, but uh, we'll carry on. Uh, another uh, high-scoring, if I can put it that way, question was about to do with um, it, obviously, uh, you know, plenty of our peatlands are in a bad state. Uh, this came out nicely in Stephen's talk about some of the Article 17 reporting results, but plenty are currently classified as unfavourable based on lacking a few key species. So how does this link up with the actual functions provided in terms of carbon storage, etc.? It really needs to be joined up with functions. How to address this, uh, which is a good question. Um, I wonder, Ian, could I ask you just to, to uh, respond to that? So it's 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 basically you, around. You can uh, ask me. I can, I can have a go. Have a go. Sorry, yeah, don't take. Do, <clears throat> so uh, you know when many of our habitats are classified as unfavourable based on lacking a few key species. How does this link up with the actual functions they provide us, with, such as carbon storage, etc.? Yeah. Well, I take issue with the the point a bit to start with anyway. I mean, that that's only one of the measures of um, favourable or unfavourableness. Um, and very often, I mean, if those species are being used correctly as indicators, they should also be reflecting some element of ecosystem function. Um, that's not to say that our monitoring is perfect by any means and I think particularly for peatlands and I think the way it's, it's developed over time and that it was meant to be done fairly rapidly a lot of the kind of environmental drivers are not properly uh, evaluated within that assessment and certainly what we're doing in England is developing um, a, a, a more comprehensive package of monitoring particularly around favorable conservation status which looks at structure and function which will incorporate those more abiotic drivers particularly uh, the hydrological regime uh, and also elements of soil structure I mean obviously these things take take a lot of time and a lot of resource to monitor so if we have the underpinning science and then proxies from that then that's always going to be a more realistic proposition than having to look in massive detail at all sites. So I think that's where the you know the, the link between the practitioner and the researcher needs needs to be much stronger. But um, I think, but you know, particularly for for wetland, I mean, you know, we're talking about resilience of ecosystems here, aren't we? And very often, you lose the biodiversity they become less resilient and it, it's it's very much um it's all interconnected and uh I, I, you know I, th I think the the kind of splitting into ecological and environment and abiotic is, is you know it, it needs to be brought together much more clearly but peatlands do that i think by their very nature uh so i get yeah we need much more integration between those things there's no doubt Okay, thank you, Ian. I, what I'm going to try and do is pick questions uh, for each of our speakers this morning. Um, so I'm going to uh, go on to uh, Simon Wooden's uh, subject area and a question concerning red grouse. Should the red grouse be a species we seek to protect as the land management required to maintain its population causes degraded landscapes, poor in ecosystem services and other aspects of biodiversity? Also, we seek to shoot it every summer, so I don't get it. That's the question. Simon, would you like to address that, please? Uh, yes, uh, um, I'll try to address it quite quickly. I, I suppose the, um, a lot of the um, current growth more management is unsustainable for, um, for overall peatland management, but it's, um, 
uh, I think we would be looking at a much more sustainable way of managing um, uplands and peatlands um, so that there's a more sort of a natural level of um, gross populations. There are you know, red gross does occur in parts of the country where there is no shooting, um, quite large uh, parts of the uplands. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I think red gross is a natural. Uh, hello, conference. Sorry about that. I think we may have lost you just for a moment there um, due to a technical problem. Hopefully you can hear us again uh, now. Um, so we're still in the question and answer uh, session and I was going to pose one to Melissa and Craig about the um, the invertebrate talk which I gave, which I think was very appropriate. I think we often forget or overlook the importance of uh, our often very rich invertebrate uh, communities on peatland sites and I was going to ask Melissa, are there standard protocols that relatively non-specialist people could be using to, to assess invertebrate populations? And are there are there common species we should be focusing on that have indicator value, please? So uh, there are indeed species that are common on most peatlands that are very good at um, indicating the level of degradation or how good a quality they are. The easiest one for most people to probably look for is the large heath butterfly that was mentioned in the talk earlier. It specializes on feeding on um, hare's tail cotton grass. So you can only find it on bogs where there, there is a decent amount of that. The easiest way to look for um, these kind of butterflies and moths is doing butterfly transects. So that's walking for a specific amount of time, keeping an eye on the surroundings, five on either side of you and five meters up into the air and recording what you see and when. Um, other survey methods that are relatively easy for people to carry out are moth traps because they also attract nighttime flying beetles and flies as well as parasitic wasps um, and fit counts. So pollinator fit counts during the summer, uh, sitting down for 10 minutes or so and looking for specific um, there are quite a lot of helpful um, online areas that you can look at and websites for identification for things that you don't need. Um, that is probably the easiest way to look. Yes, the main one is probably both um, monitoring. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Melissa. And, and thank you again for um, covering for, for Craig this morning. We really appreciate that. Uh, a question for Martin, if that's okay. Um, from a questioner who really welcomes the focus on functional um, uh, biodiversity and on traits rather than species genomes. Um, uh, predicting metabolic traits from genomic sequences is a key issue. Are you considering this approach, uh, please? Uh, yeah, I guess the, um, the, the inev inevitable kind of knock on from a project that identifies a whole load of research questions is then, okay, how are we going to address those? Um, and clearly that, that's something that, that from the workshops was, was identified as a, as a really kind of useful way forward. So yes, is the short answer that um, you know, there are a number of um, kind of project ideas that are coming together around that. Um, one or two of the, the people that came to the workshops have, have started to um, kind of develop PhD projects on some of the, the kind of um, restored peatland sites that, that, that some of the peatland scientists were able to point at. Um, we haven't interacted directly with MIB. We've been more talking to the uh, microbiologists in, in earth sciences in, in Manchester, but actually the, the group of microbiologists um, is, is much broader. It's, it's kind of across the whole country. and. And, and yes, is the short answer that these are the things that we're beginning to try to pull together. And as perhaps I could just hop back to one of the previous questions, um, the question about monitor, or the two questions about monitoring and function. And, and you know, I, I very much agree that, that we we should be trying to build function into into our monitoring approaches. But, but you know, recognizing it in its point that you can't go out and measure gas flux and water table at, at every bog that you're looking at. And in a sense, that's that was one of the directions we were trying to pick up with the, the microbial work is that, you know, if you have the right ratio of, let's say, methanogens and methanotrophs in your bog, that might tell you something about whether the methane flux is in a is in a kind of healthy range. And that's something that you could 
do by you know picking up a, a spoonful of peat and uh, and doing a fairly quick assay of of, of what was living in it. So uh, maybe it, it is still thinking about diversity, but it's thinking about below ground diversity as well as above ground diversity. Okay, thanks, Martin. And I think it, you know it's well worth looking at the uh, web link that Martin provided in his talk. There's a lot of interesting stuff here that really does broaden our perspective on um, peatland biodiversity and uh, and functionality. And a question specific for Ollie now: um, What about natural regeneration on organo-mineral soils? Uh, question mark bog bog woodland wetland margin scrub etc are all naturally occurring habitats uh, the questioner totally supports the restoration of commercially planted bogs but we're in danger of setting up a false dichotomy aren't we healthy peatlands aren't completely treeless scrubby mosaics on drier patches should exist uh, very pertinent question i suspect we could talk for quite a long time on this but ollie could you have a go at addressing that please yeah absolutely really really key key point um, and the key point is that this is about what is naturally occurring and not about what we may choose to do intensively on the site. Um, so the RSPB um, is against commercial planting on peatlands of, of all types, um, uh, getting to the very tr tricky areas where you have organic mineral soils and what is a peatland type and, and so on and so forth. And that's a really a very different question, what, what we want to restore on peatlands and what comes in naturally. We absolutely need those, that diversity of different, um, of different uh, vegetation types on, on peatland. And actually that leads me to another, another point uh, which kind of harks back a little bit to the favourable conservation status and what is the true favourable conservation status of peatlands particularly in the context of climate change, where things will, you know, we're on a trajectory of change and we don't know where we're going. The species uh, will be really important to understand and to monitor on our sites, but our notion of what a favourable collection of species regarding any particular habitat type will inevitably change over time. Um, so let's be open to this in a naturalistic sort of way, rather than um, a, a, massive, a massively intervention um, sort of way, which um, I think the commercial forestry um, is clearly inappropriate and not part of that natural uh, variety and that natural trajectory of change that we have quite an exciting uh, time ahead of us. Great, thank you very much, Ollie. So we've just hit 20 past 12. Um, so I think that takes us to the end of this session, but we can carry on in the in the in the chat uh, slot that now follows this. Um, so do please stay around. We've not by any means posed all the questions that were um, that were asked. I'm sure lots of other things will come on. Um, so uh, we'll move on to that session now. It just remains for me to thank all the presenters this morning. Thank you very much indeed. It's a great range of, of talks, um, a fantastic span of the subject area. Um, uh, so thanks, thanks very much. Thanks also to Tim, our, our, our technical person for making sure it all worked. Uh, so thank you very much, Tim. And uh, thanks to the conference for listening. And we'll uh, speak to those of you who want to join the chat session in a minute. Thank you. Thank you.